good news. We're back with another episode of Armchair Architects, the Azure Enablement Series. That's an ongoing conversation with Eric and Uli, two of the smartest architects I know. This episode, we're going to talk about Internet of Things, IoT. So join us. Hey, so welcome back to another episode of Armchair Architects as part of the Azure Enablement Show. So we're going to take this in a completely different direction. Um, we're going to we're going to use a three-letter acronym, and we're going to talk heavily about the land of IoT, the Internet of Things, um, because my sense is that there is a different way of thinking about this stuff when it comes to architecture than maybe some of the other stuff we've talked about. So. Um, with uh, with my esteemed guests Uli and Eric, I would love to get into that question. Like Eric or Uli, like why is an IoT related architecture any different than any other architecture? Like, I, you know, isn't it the same thing? I mean, cool devices, but like, what else? Well, I think that there's there's a couple of terms that we probably should introduce uh, our audience to. Um, okay. There's a concept of brownfield versus greenfield. Uh, and it's pretty much like it sounds. Greenfield is, I don't have anything. I'm actually going to build a plant or factory or manufacture automobiles or coffee makers. And I know I want to internet enable these things so that they can talk to the cloud and I can do all sorts of interesting things from understand how these devices are being used to forecast demand, to figure out how to drive analytical uh, workloads off of them. The brownfield world is pretty much where things get a little bit challenging in that I have equipment that might have been around for 40 years or is already in place in situ doing things that are production that are productive. And I need to know how to optimize the efficiency of that particular collection of devices. But those things are not naturally connected to the Internet. And I have to somehow reverse engineer our way to get all the telemetry that may exist in complex plants and um, strange, um, you know, aggregation elements and pockets like MES and SCADA systems and all these different environments. And I need to bring that into the cloud so I can do something meaningful with it. Right. Alternatively, I might even have to do something before it gets to the cloud. I might actually have to figure out whether or not a particular component, uh, an oven or a cooker or anything, is exhibiting signs of trouble. And I may need to take action at the edge because the cloud is a slow path in that circumstance. So I just kind of wanted to introduce those two terms, introduce those two terms, and then at the same time, figuring out the architecture underneath it is vastly different because now I have messages that are being submitted to the cloud maybe once or twice an hour for washing machines and coffee makers, but maybe hundreds of thousands of messages per second for uh, plants, multiple uh, manufacturing plants around the world. So let me throw a little bit of a different perspective on this one. Again, I agree with Eric's perspective that brownfield is important, greenfield and those kind of things. But for me, David, it's not a over here and over there thing. It's just different patterns that you have to think about. A device pattern simply means you have to deal with reality. It's not a infinitely malleable artifact like software where you can imagine things and as long as you can code it, it kind of exists. No, as um, Eric mentioned, there is a thing called a cooker or a cracker or a valve or a coffee maker that actually has physical attributes and they are not malleable. They are there. And so you have to deal with this physical object and find a representation uh, that you can work with. And again, that's what this device um, concept is all about, where you can effectively say a device might be standalone like a coffee maker. It might be part of a bigger something. Uh, like a cracker is part of a plant. And Eric unconsciously introduced a couple of really interesting manufacturing things where a plant is for continuous processes, like a chemical process or uh, making coffee or stuff like that, uh, which is batch processing um, in this case, or a factory, which is discrete manufacturing, like building a car or building a computer. Uh, those things are discrete objects that ultimately come out, whereas the process industry runs a process and then they come out with bulk products like chemical products or stuff like that. And that's where the term plant is for the continuous process, whereas discrete manufacturing is a factory. Uh, but ultimately, it, it deals with the physical reality, different types of physical reality, because in a plant, for example, it's important to look at what's the weather temperature, what's the quality of the ingredients that go into the, uh, the processing, whereas in discrete manufacturing, weather often doesn't play a role. It can, but generally it doesn't. Um, and the ingredients, the quality of the ingredient is important, but it's easier to manage and measure because you can 
visually observe them and saying, oh, right. this piece that I want to build into my new car is doesn't meet the quality bar, so you throw it away. Whereas in the bulk pieces, you have to do different measurements because you're getting a ton of, of whatever the ingredient is. And you can't just take every piece of the piece of the one ton and say, yep, this is a great ingredient. So there's other things you have to do uh, to measure the quality of the ingredient because what comes in influences what comes out at the end of the day. Um, and so those are the differences when you think about uh, the IoT world, which is really a reflection of the physical real world in a digital world. Both of you have surprised me. You've surprised me because I was expecting you to say something about quantity, uh, the sheer quantity of information, of processing, of data, being one of the differentiators between IoT situations and other situations. Is that not the case? Did I just make that up? Or is that not, not a thing you think about? I, I think it's a I'm sorry, I was just going to say, I think it's a common perception that when you're talking about IoT, you're imagining, as Uli said, these manufacturing plants that are that have maybe hundreds of pieces of physical equipment that are always running or is running as much as possible with as little downtime as possible. In those circumstances, you're talking about ingesting hundreds of thousands of messages per second over time. There are loosely connected devices, which are you know consumer electronics, such as televisions or coffee makers or washing machines. And I don't want to characterize them as um, not connected. Those are certainly connected, but the velocity and volume of telemetry that those things are sending to the cloud aren't typically on par with a manufacturing plant. Uh, in addition, a manufacturing plant may have all of these pockets of telemetry and aggregation points as well. But what I, one of the key things that an architect in this space has to think about is something that Uli mentioned, which is we absolutely need to maintain the context of these messages that these devices are sending to the cloud. Um, one of our customers that we chat with quite frequently has said, hey, Eric, you know, you, we need to make sure that we don't forget what we already know. And what they meant by that is, as you send in telemetry, which are basically signals like, hey, my temperature is this, my uh, uptime is this, and, you know, my, uh, my, gr my grasper um, pressure is this, that's terrific. And it, it, it's burned with the asset ID or the unique machine ID, but that's all we know if that's all we were looking at which is largely time series data. What we also need to do is to have a graph-based representation of the entities, attributes, and relationships that generated that telemetry and have a way of bringing those together from an architectural perspective so that I can ask questions. I can ask questions like, hey, tell me about the average temperature of the cookers in my Taiwan plant uh, versus the one in my, um, you know, my Shanghai plant, for example. Without the uh, understanding of where those those assets exist in physical space, in addition to their time series telemetry, we can't answer that question. And that's what architecture needs to solve. So like a yeah, but again, I want to come back, David, to yeah, a ahead. question you asked, which is, why are we not scared about the number of messages? While manufacturing specifically is very, very complex, and there's a lot of uh, existing legacy that needs to be incorporated, the number of messages that a modern internet service, especially if you think about a consumer-based service has to deal with, is far, far more complex and higher than um, what a manufacturing plant has to deal with. They are very big. Um, we have customers where they have a manufacturing plant uh, that is the size of Manhattan. Mm. So these are big, big plants, but ultimately they still have a finite number of messages that is fairly stable actually because the system produces what the system produces whereas a internet site can go into these cycles and as you know uh, managing or dealing with uh, large spikes and cycles is much harder than dealing with a constant uh, pressure and so that's where i think people are not scared but what more is more complicated is a contextualization like eric pointed out and the other one that Eric also pointed out, which I think is worth repeating, is that a lot of data gets produced, but it has very, very short temporal value. Hmm. And it's actually not necessarily relevant, for example, the development of AI models, which is what a lot of people are trying to do to get to predictive maintenance and other scenarios, which help you uh, prevent issues in the factory or in the plant or with a specific uh, device that you're managing. Um, and it only has temporal value, but that temporal value at that point in time is super important. 
um, again, if you go back to a chemical process, the right. temperature um, of the specific process element is really important. If it varies too much, it might ruin the entire batch of processing. Therefore, you need to be able to react very fast in real, in, in real time, um, and therefore local processing is important. Whereas other elements, uh, you can actually go and run uh, for longer processing because they're not necessarily uh, relevant for this specific process, but they are relevant, for example, for, for the maintenance of the specific device, the crackers or the cookers or whatever it might be, um, but they are not necessarily um, required in real time. So thinking through what data is what, how do I react to specific data elements and where do you react? What are you using that data for? Is it relevant for longer term processing? That means you need to figure out a way to get it into the cloud. If it's only a very, uh, realistic or um, needed for short term, short twitch reaction to make sure that the process goes the right way, uh, you might not need to put it into the cloud. You might still want to keep it and maybe archive it to the cloud, um, but you might not want to push it in real time to the cloud. Um, and those are some of the decisions that make um, IoT architectures more complicated. Um, and also the variety of devices. Uh, again, as Eric mentioned, factories have 20, 30, 40 years old equipment that obviously weren't built right. for digital updates. How do you deal with that? Then you have a variety of op operating systems um, and the uh, hierarchy that are associated with. I have seen customers use NT4 in their devices. Um, and we certainly don't know how to update NT4 anymore. Joking aside, we still do that, but uh, that's obviously much more complicated than updating a modern Windows IoT or Linux-based distribution. So you have to deal with that kind of variety, um, and that makes IoT fun. Well, I would, I think, I in, in my defense, I think I was probably thinking a little bit of the sort of the consumer side of IoT, where the question is, what happens if everybody, you know, on the Eastern Seaboard, all replaces all of their light bulbs with something that goes, "Hey, I'm a light bulb. Hey, I'm a light bulb." Or I want this color, please. Uh, you know. That sort, of, that sort of thing. Are there different models that one uses when it comes to architecture for IoT than one does for others? We talked about design patterns in, in the past. Are there design patterns that are more or less suited for IoT sort of situations? Or, or were there any developed specifically for IoT that you can think of off the top of your head? Because I'm just curious, like how, how different is architecture for IoT different from any other architecture? Is sort of, sort of the last question I want to throw at you. So the, the reuse part is certainly things like messaging, queuing, right. publish and subscribe is very, very common inside IoT. Uh, we haven't talked about actors, actor programming. Uh, that's very, very common and very um, yeah, popular in um, IoT because an actor can represent a device really well because it composes functionality and state in a single mm -hmm. document mm -hmm. is what lots of people call it. And therefore, um, a lot of people choose to use the actor um, pattern uh, to represent their IoT devices. Um, and so that's a very common thing from a what's new. And again, you see that in other scenarios, but that's very common in IoT is, and Eric is a master at this, is data fusion. Uh, because you have to fuse together a number of data sources to get to the ultimate data that you want to analyze. And you can't simply say, this is the pure data. You have to say, oh, but it's only relevant if it's in this plant, in this production line. So you need to contextualize the data. You might need to bring additional data sets like weather. Mm -hmm. um, then what's very often the case is that the data sets out of the factory or plant or even the device is incomplete uh, because it doesn't have all the data you need. So you need to bring other data sets in. That's what's called data fusion. So that's a very common pattern in IoT. There's other applications where that is also very common uh, in AI development, but in general, that's a very uh, it's yeah very common in IoT. For example, I don't know Eric, if there's any others that are very specific outside of specific standards like OPC UA in manufacturing, um, HL7 in um, healthcare. So Fire. there's a whole bunch of these kind of things that are very specific, but those are more of the same in terms of messaging, queuing, pub sub, those kind of capabilities. Yeah, I agree. I was listening very closely, Uli, to make sure my mental model kind of lined up with yours, and I'm, it, it does. I, I think there's three coarse-grained buckets of an IoT architecture that, that an IoT architecture has to satisfy. It has to connect in terms of being able to allow routes for 
devices to send telemetry to the edge and then extensively to the cloud. It has to collect that information, persist it somewhere where it can be um, looked at and analyzed in the future and maybe potentially used to train AI models, but certainly answer questions and then analyze, which is bringing together that data fusion component and bringing together all of the different components that are required. How can we actually make sure that um, the solution does what it needs to do? Uh, and so I think the important factor here is amongst those three coarse grain solution components, um, we do scale ingestion. We do um, uh, the fusion of the data where we, we take time series telemetry, merge it with things like digital twin platforms for the context, and then we present that with metadata to the cloud um, so that people can analyze it through tools like you know, Power BI or Tableau or, or, or those uh, different types of analytical tools. Okay, so I wanna go deeper into this, but I think we're gonna be out of time here unless, um, unless you wanna go deeper, but you're starting to make me wonder about something, something that feels a little adjacent to this which is you actually, in fact, you even use the word edge. Um, I would love to go to something that I feel, to me feels a little adjacent to the IoT space, which is the edge computing space. Um, up for visiting the neighbor of IoT next? How could Absolutely. we not? Sounds great. Well, I want to thank you, um, Uli and Eric, and I'd like to thank everybody for watching this episode of uh, Armchair Architects as part of the Azure Enablement Show. See you next time.